Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm USA Today bestselling author, Russell Nolte, the creator of Cthulhu is Hard to Spell, Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter, and The Gods vs. Chronicles. You can find my work at russellnolte.com, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hey, I'm Lori Foster, owner of Unlikely Hero Studios, inker, editor, art director, cosplayer, Unlikely Hero Studios at www.uhstudios.com, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. And we're talking with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who are our guests today? Our guests today are two very talented people. One is the creator of Cthulhu is hard to spell, but it's easier to say. That's, that's my secondary tag. And the other is the owner of, of course, UH Studio, which is in her lower third as well, too. We're joined by the ever-talented... Lori Foster and Russell Nolte. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Lori Foster. I'm the owner of Unlikely Hero Studios. I'm an inker. I'm an editor. I'm a cosplayer. I kind of do a whole bunch of stuff. Russell Nolte. I'm a USA Today bestselling author, fantasy, sci-fi, and horror. I'm the editor of the Cthulhu is Hard to Spell anthology series for the volumes that we have. Back or kidding right now. And then I wrote all of these books behind me. So it's safe to say that we have multiple areas we could talk about today. We'll focus on, of course, not only Cthulhu is Hard to Spell as a series, we'll also talk about the Unlikely Hero Studio as well, too, in both of your respective areas and how you came together about this particular project. But the question for both of you is this. What is the most misunderstood aspect about horror in comics? Oh, all right. I think I have an answer to this. I'll go. So I'll go first. Lori, you can think for a second. My okay. answer is that it is almost impossible to scare someone in comics. It is because horror is about unsettling you. I don't want to say it's rather easy, but like it's considerably easier to do so in movies and in music because there are different emotions that go through. You can't just turn a page and know what's coming. Also easier, I think, to do it in novels because there's this dread that comes into you when you're like hearing it in your brain. With comics, it's very, very hard. I've only, I think, been truly terrified of a book two or three times in my entire like reading comics career. My answer would be that better uses of horror in comics are not to do like jump scare type books or slasher books. They're to focus more on like the psychological unsettling nature of humanity. Well, geez. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would say that you need an, the, the misconception would be that you need an R rating for a book to be scary. I don't think you need one. I think just saying with our book, it's all ages appropriate, but there's still some really scary stories in it is a great segue into what we're here for, of course, is Cthulhu is hard to spell. So for those that don't know anything about that series, tell us what it's all about. Because from what I've seen, and it is the varying artists you have, the varying brief clips that I've gotten to see. I mean, Kat Kalamia introduced me to both of you as well, too. So she was a, a wonderful entrance into this series that I not had heard about before. So it's kind of like a, a grab bag as, as to what the series is all about, first off. And then we'll talk about the artists and writers that are also joined in this series. All right. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Hulu is Hard to Spell is an all-ages anthology series focusing on the gods and monsters of Lovecraft. So I'm very big when I create universes that, like, they need a reason to exist and books and such. And so I felt like as a white het cis male, like, my perception of the Cthulhu universe has been very, very, very well represented in the history of Lovecraft. And my goal was to get as many people that 
uh, had different lived experiences than me to talk about the gods and monsters themselves. And so part of it was that I wanted to focus on the gods and monsters of the Lovecraft universe, uh, not on the horror necessarily, although there are some just terrifying stories in there. And Laurie is completely right. Like you can absolutely have an all ages. In fact, without blood, guts, and cursing, like something times is even more horrific what you can do in a story. The two kind of overarching encapsulating concepts that, it, uh, well, I guess three. One, it's uh, all ages. Even though there are some very, very adult things uh, in the books, there's no blood, sex, horror, or violence that you can't see on Saturday morning television. Okay. So you can read it with your five-year-old, you can give it to somebody who uh, wants to be indoctrinated in the horror who's older. You can give it to people who don't like cursing, blood, sex, whatever those things. And you also can have a really good time with it if you do like those things. Uh, that was really the barometer of what we really wanted to do. When my first book, Monsters and Other Scary Shit, came out, we found that kids were reading it, which that book is not all ages appropriate. And they were reading it over time and coming back to different stories as they matured. And I really wanted to recapture that with the Cthulhu is Hard to Spell brand as well. So we want something that's like Lovecraft for the whole family. We want to focus on the gods and monsters, not the horror aspect, although you can have both. Third is we want this to be a uh, Lovecraft for everyone. So I tried very hard to fill it with as many people with different lived experiences as possible. You can show that Lovecraft has touched everybody. And generally nobody knows who Lovecraft is, but they, they know his stories, whether it's Stephen King or uh, James Cameron or Neil Gaiman, like just about every creator who's ever worked in uh, really any writing medium has at least some bit of Lovecraft's mythos fallen out on you even if it's just the necronomicon like necronomicon was invented by lovecraft and so if you've ever seen the necronomicon or heard of the necronomicon like you know of lovecraft's work how about you laurie what are your experiences with cthulhu's hard to spell from from your avenue russell brought this awesome series to us to republish and then of course as he's stopping uh, publishing it. And I mean, basically everything he said was something that I'm interested in, that I'm into, that I like Lovecraft, but I want to see him represented by these different creators, these different ways. And it's really what makes the book so unique and awesome. What was the first story that you got to read then, Lori, in Cthulhu is hard to spell that made you a fan of this particular series? I think the very first one that I read was one of Russell's stories, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, he, once he brought the series to me, he actually made new stories that we can add to the books. So those are also really awesome. I hate to plug Russell because he's already making the series and he's the creator, but his story first, I got pulled in and then I got addicted to all of the other stories in there. There's so much cool stuff. So, Russell, when you were approaching other creative minds in terms of uh, adding to this collection. Who was one of the ones that you really sought out to be part of this series? Oh, I sought out so many people. We have three groups of people that we went for. People who were doing their first book or like one of their first books or someone who was quite new in the universe. People who were indie creators who were my friends and then like big name people who would work on the book. So the first person, it's hard because the person at the entire series I pursued the most was Chris Simon, who was my co-editor on the second, third book. And she is now the group editor at IDW, one of the group editors at IDW. So I pursued her because I wanted to bring in other lived experiences. And I didn't want to be one of those people who just said, I believe in this without actually following through. So after the first volume, I was looking for other points of view to help expand out. She was able to bring in Ray Anthony Height, who is a great friend of mine, and Paul Jenkins, who I love dearly, Trina Robbins. I should probably say that working with those legends is the thing that was the most rewarding, but that was rewarding. But really seeing the newer artists who I was able to bring in to bring another perspective. So one person I remember stopping was Kelsey Jo Silva, who I love and has worked with me a bunch of times, who was our artist guest at San Diego last year. And I remember looking at her work and she was like, I don't do horror. And I was like, great, that's perfect. Like we, I want slice of life stuff in here. Like I 
want your style. Like I want to see how you can work with the universe. So I always know there's going to be plenty of people who have grown up with Lovecraft, who love Lovecraft, who love horror. And the people that I'm trying to bring in are people who can bring in a different perspective. So someone like when Trina Robbins did her story, she did like a romance. It was like a date gone wrong between Lovecraft. It was like very much like a romance comic. Uh, when Kelsey came in, she did like a very slice of life story about Medusa and Yig uh, summoning a Cherberus puppy to learn how to love it and live with it, even though it was kind of rambunctious. And so those are the stories that in the first volume, we had a story by Madeline Holly Rosing and Melissa Massey that was about Orna Numqua in marriage counseling. One of the things I really like dealing with the mythos is it's a very high barrier to entry book. Lovecraft is maybe the highest barrier to entry author that has remained popular in the 20th century. He will put something in like three paragraphs in one book. And like, if you literally just glaze over for like two minutes as you're passing through it, you will not even know what the relationship is. And so having these stories that are like, okay, like will Orn and Numqua ever go to marriage counseling? No, <laughs> you understand the relationship that they have very easily. It's like, oh, they're like the Ross and Rachel of the Lovecraft universe. Or we had a story in the last volume, which was someone, Monster Hunter, was going through the woods and caught up with Shub Niggeroth. And she turns and goes, you want to see a picture of my kids? And just had like a thousand pictures of like kids, this wallet. And like, now you're like, oh, well, she is the sort of one who births a lot of the Lovecraft monsters. And you kind of understand relationally where these are coming to. So I don't remember who the first person I pursued was, but I do know that it was very easy to find people who worked in horror who wanted to work in Lovecraft, and I'm most proud of other people who we got to fill out, whether they were people, whoever they were, they had this other experience with Lovecraft, and like Angela Oddly made these beautiful stories, and Kelsey Jo Silva, and all of these, I could name all of the people. <laughs> the one I remember most was I was so scared to talk to Kelsey at a show, because like, I loved her work so much, and she had worked on Pixie Dust. And I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And like, I think that was probably the hardest. It was way harder than like Paul or any of the other people that I talked to. Laurie, in terms of UH Studios, what is the, your company's role in regards to Cthulhu's Hard to Spell? Just so that we have that connection as well, too. <laughs> we are re-releasing. So Russell initially released three gigantic hardcovers. We're splitting each of those basically in half and re-releasing them as shorter soft covers and then adding some stories to each. So they are a little different and changing the covers, uh, making releasing new covers, I should say. So we're re-releasing those and then we're going to be curating and making and publishing the anthology from here forward. So we're going to be making a couple of new volumes as well as some other stuff within the Cthulhu's Hard to Spell universe. So Campaigns like this, crowdfunding campaigns are usually like a second or third job, depending on how many jobs you currently have. What has been the, uh, the fan reaction to, of course, the re-release of the series we funded today to that's good oh, congratulations. yes we funded today <laughs> <laughs> it seems really good they seem excited and one of the reasons why we're re-releasing it was kind of to make it more accessible 25 dollar price point per book is nice so if you didn't get the books originally or you just got them digitally it's easier to get a hold of one or all three of them on this campaign uh, it'll make it easier to get it into stores as well so i think the fans are excited about that we have a couple of retailers who have pledged to the campaign so that's awesome now that it's it's fully funded russell how about your side of things what are you looking forward to accomplishing with the stretch goals maybe with this campaign Fans have always asked me for merch and I don't do merch. Lori and their team does great merch. I'm excited that fans can finally get some merch options that they may have looked for. Honestly, what I'm really looking forward to is volume seven and also the new stories. I know the story that I wrote. We have some really cool other creators who are going to be on this story. Some of which I've been wanting to work with, Michael Norwitz, like I've been trying to get him in the book for a while, being able to expand it out that way. This is just the first step. Originally, when I went to Lori, I said, do you want more volumes? And then we started to talk about the publishing contract and like work all that stuff out. And then I was like, well, this is stupid. Like you're just going to start like later. And like, you're basically starting without having the first three volumes of stuff. What about reprinting all of that stuff before like leading up to volume seven so that people 
people can have it all consistently. People really like having the consistency and see our books behind. We care about like branding and making everything look good and like making it feel like a series. So when we finally settled on doing these relaunch campaigns first, let me introduce you to our audience. Let me get introduced to your audience so like we can build up this thing. But I would say like, March, there's this really adorable, like hand painted figurines in this campaign, which like are so awesome. And a lot of the work Laura is doing now, I don't want to speak for her, is stewarding the books that have already come. What I am excited for is the reason that I approached Lori in the first place was because like she has an exceptional mind for like curating and finding the right people for anthologies. While I love getting all of the love for my own work because I'm, I'm a vain narcissist. Uh, I really am excited to see what Lori and her team is going to do with volume seven, eight, nine, with all the other things that we're playing with all the supplementals. It's really the kind of series that can last forever. Like I really want it to be like Twisted Dark. Twisted Dark has, I don't know if Twisted Dark still exists, but the last time I saw them, they had like something like 20 volumes or something. And there's no reason why this just can't keep coming out as like a staple year after year, as long as Laurie and us want to maintain it and do other things in it. So that's what I'm really uh, excited about. And I'm excited that people can finally get the soft covers they've been hammering me about for years. And I'm very excited that they can get the merch that they've been asking me about for years because there's a lot of stuff that I love. I've been like, Lori, what if we do this? What if we do that? What if we do that? I would like to do this, but I don't want to actually run this thing. So that's been really cool too. <laughs> Uh, I am also very excited about merch. I've been sending, in terms of stretch goals, we asked the backers and the backers are very excited about book upgrades, but I am very excited about merch. So I'm not sure what we're going to do for our first stretch goal. <laughs> Uh, but I sent uh, Russell a couple of images the other day of some crazy like Cthulhu pajama pants and some <laughs> some legging crazy stuff we can do. So I don't know. I'm kind of torn. <laughs> I, I want to do a bunch of stuff. I'm hoping we hit a bunch of stretch goals so we can do book upgrades and merge, make everybody happy. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you? in your career i i don't know i don't have them ranked um <laughs> well the one that i'm stuck on now as i just turned 40 is that your first half of your career or like getting up to middle age is all about putting armor on to prevent you from being hurt by people or like being hurt and then putting armor on. And the second half of your career or life is really about realizing that that weight, that burden is too heavy to carry forever and trying to find ways to take that armor off. Specifically is relevant in this conversation because one of the pieces of armor that I had put on for so long was I don't work with partners. Like I run everything. And so working with Lori and some of the other, my business partner, Monica and other people people have been really eye-opening in the ability to take off of that armor and trust other people to carry on projects without me being the person leading every day and every minute. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm still thinking I'm terrible at this. I think that the piece of advice that's sticking out to me recently would be to not feel bad to set boundaries and take breaks. <laughs> This has always been an issue of mine and yeah, until recently I did not apply it at all. And yeah, it's becoming more important. I think it's important for everybody to realize, especially in this industry, because <laughs> everyone in comic is working their butts off, you know, 80 hours a week or whatever it is. So take break because it'll make you more productive in the long run. <laughs> Also saying no, I think, is another thing that a lot of us don't do very often or because we think we're going to hurt their person's feelings, whatever they're asking, when we need to set those boundaries too. A hundred percent. Exactly. <laughs> You're calling me out. <laughs> I'm horrible at that myself because I say yes to every interview that comes across my plate for the most part. <laughs> there are some lines I do draw, but, you know, creative people like yourselves in the varying industries that you've created from creating a publishing company to showcasing a remastered version of an amazing series with Cthulhu is hard to spell. Russell's work in terms of finding new people and new creative uh, art, being a best-selling author. I don't think we take time for ourselves and realize we've actually accomplished a lot in not only our 
lives, but in our careers. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. It's really important to self-care and to think about the things that you've done and not constantly worry about what you need to do. I know that's a thing that Russell does too, I think, is constantly looking like, you know, a year in the future, which is good, but also it's good to be like, okay, this is what I've accomplished and today I can take a nap, <laughs> you say no to a few people and take some time for myself to recharge. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Okay. I want to see this was not, it's not a huge bummer of a, of a thing. That's the one that that's, that's the hard part. Now, um, I used to deliver newspapers when I was a kid and I remember realizing like I would go to pick up the papers at the distribution center. There were people inside who were writing the pieces that I was literally like delivering. Just that revelation was very powerful for me. And then realizing that people are making decisions based on words on a page. And I worked on Capitol Hill afterwards and I worked in news and I have a degree in journalism and all of these things kind of started with that revelation that somebody is writing these words and then another person is going to have feelings or make judgments or change policy because of the words that this human wrote, even though I have no idea who that human is. I was born and grew up in Montreal in Quebec. Most people there are bilingual. They're English and French, but there's constantly an ongoing problem in Quebec with language laws. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the province wants to make sure everyone is French and there's, you know, people there who originally learned English and there's laws about making sure the French language on signs is larger than the English language. And it's just kind of mind blowing. And I get it because, you know, you don't want as a culture, like as a French culture, you don't want to lose that language, you know, when the world is teaching everyone English, you want to, you want to make sure everyone also knows French. And I think that's awesome. Teaching people to be bilingual from a young age is awesome, but that power that I guess it can hold to the point where people are, you know, actually upset if their language isn't big enough on a sign <laughs> is kind of mind blowing. It, when I was a kid, I didn't quite understand it. I was like, oh, cool. You know, like I'm learning two languages. I can communicate it in two different ways. But as I got older and I noticed, you know, people were getting upset about this kind of thing. And, you know, some people were refused to learn English and some people refused to learn French. And it's just, it's absolutely crazy. Like we should all be learning multiple languages and it's a privilege to do so. Anyway, it's interesting. <laughs> As a fellow Canadian, I can completely understand. I stopped taking French at grade nine. So, you know, being from Ontario, I, I think it was one of those things where I was like, ah, when am I going to ever use it? And then I went to Montreal. I'm like, damn it, I wish I would have studied more. <laughs> Right. And <laughs> depending on where you go, it's, it's entirely French. Like yeah. you, they won't speak English. <laughs> yeah. They'll just look at you sideways like, what, who is this freak? <laughs> right. <laughs> what challenges do creative people face in today's society that needs to be addressed? Reigning in AI is a pretty good one. I mean, that's, that's like the biggie. Having ways to delete people stealing your work for NFTs is another, you know, like, those are the two big ones that I deal with on a relatively general basis. Ethical consumption of NFTs and AI are two huge problems. They're problems that are pretty specific to the creative industries. Other industries have very, very strict laws or bylaws or policies about how they deal, pay for, and distribute AI. But for some reason, like all art and writing based ones are just like, let's just throw it out here and throw a bomb and not have anything like that is the existential threat needs to be dealt with, with regulation and with an industry saying, how can we be good stewards? And like, nobody is stepping up to be there. Like regulators are saying, let's let the companies decide, or let's let this go until we can find out more. And companies are like, you can regulate us, but we're not going to do anything until regulation is, is happening. So that is the big threat. But it's not a threat, I think, in the way that most people would say it's a threat. I'm saying it's a threat to like the idea that creating means anything. Most of my friends wake up and I have at least one conversation a week, probably like a day, 
that people are like, I don't know why I even try if people are just going to steal my art and use it for NFTs or AI or in some way. In many ways, it was always present with like splatter artists and other people doing this, but like it's so brazen now and people are starting to see like their friends, their parents, like other people that they care about brazenly not even care at all. And that very hard to get over and to still like be able to continue to do the work. While I think there needs to be all this regulation and all of these other things, just so many problems with AI and NFTs. The whole creative industry has always just been like a dumpster fire. The real threat, how do you maintain that spark of creativity? so that you can do work because I've watched more people in the past year just give up on art and do something else than I think I have collectively in the last decade before NFTs combined. Oh, <laughs> we're going to be downers today, huh? Yeah, no. Uh, in this similar vein, actually, I would say just surviving in, I'm going to use quotation marks, post-COVID, it's not really post-COVID. COVID's still here. Capitalist economy right now. Everyone's struggling. Uh, <laughs> conventions are tough. You know, attendance isn't as good. And then when you go to a convention, you're worried about getting sick. And, and then you're trying to figure out new ways to sell your product. And everyone's struggling with money. And then you're feeling bad asking people for money when they're struggling. <laughs> There's kind of a whole cycle right now of everyone struggling and the AI and the NFTs filter in as well because people are like, well, I I'll use AI because it's cheaper. And it's like, oh, no, none of this should be happening. <laughs> this isn't how this is supposed to work. Yeah, it's difficult, but this has been a, a constant battle with art and creative people in general because while they shouldn't be taken advantage of in many different areas, and I'm not even talking full corporate aspect of the four exposure models that they blatantly abuse constantly, not even dive into that aspect whatsoever, but we're all aware of it. I'm just saying it's amazing how, like what Russell was saying, the fact that creative endeavors, no matter what they are, whether it's comics, film, TV, movies, or, or video games are constantly being crapped on by many people because they want everything for free. Today's society, when we only have seconds to approach and gain people's attention and interest, two seconds later, they're on to something in regards to AI or whatever else because, oh, it's free and I don't have to pay a creative person like yourself for the talent and time and work and effort that you put into your endeavors. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's uh, you know, artists and creators are being undervalued. It's frustrating. And, you know, you release a book and people are like, oh, you made so much money. And it's like, well, actually, I, you know, I paid like 20 people. So I didn't really make any money. But, you know, <laughs> we're trying to value the creators. That's what we're trying to do. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? The first person that I could see that I remember was Kevin Smith. And it was watching Clerks and being like, oh, he just made this? He just <laughs> made a thing. Like, he just was like, oh, you don't want this? I'm just going to make it. And like the idea, and Robert Rodriguez and like those people were the creative people. I mean, like my mother and my wife and all of those people are like the, I would have to say them as well, because like they were supportive at times that I wasn't even supportive for myself. The first one I can remember was like, it clicked as I was watching Clerks. And I was like, that guy just said, I'm just going to make this thing. I was like, I didn't even know you could do that. Like, I didn't know you could just make a thing. No one can stop you. No one can stop you from making it, which is the weirdest part about the AI and, and NFT debate. No one is stopping you making art. Everyone wants you to make art. Like, go make art. Go just do it. Like, will a publisher publish it? I don't know. Will, like, an audience like it? I don't know. You can still make it. And like, no one is stopping you. Like I have books that I've drawn that look like not even a three-year-old drew them. And like, they've outsold like most people's books, I guarantee you, because it just was like, I want to learn to draw. And then I'm going to make this and put it out. And people, some people will like it and most people will not. But yeah, those, those two and Quentin Tarantino are like probably the three people that I remember distinctly saying, oh, you can just make stuff and they can't stop you. That is usually the advice I give to new people. It's like, it may be terrible, but like no one can stop you from making it as if you want to make it. 
That's awesome. Well, outside of my dad, of course, because he always, you know, he always encouraged me that I could do anything creatively, especially I would say the first like person that inspired me and I continue to look up to would be Joe Mad. Um, he's his was one of the first comics that I read. I read Battle Chasers and I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I want to make stuff like this. <laughs> so, And of course, now, you know, he's done comics, he's making video games, he's doing all kinds of cool stuff. So he continues to be an inspiration. Professionally, you are both successful in your respective areas and fields, and you have created some amazing works. And, and I would have loved to talk more about, obviously, UH Studios and, and more about your amazing career as a writer as well, Russell, too. So you both have to come back on either together or separately and talk about your respective careers so we can dive more into your creativeness. And I'm going to use that as a word. So professionally, you're both successful in your respective area. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Do you mean successful like in my personal life or do you mean do I personally find myself successful even though I objectively is true that I am successful? So I used to be very, I don't want to say down on my work, but I would definitely put my work down sometimes to some people or say like, it wasn't as good as it was. And one day a fan said like, I wish you would stop doing that. And I was like, well, I, I mean, it's my work. I can say what it's like. No, I like your work. And if you don't like your work, it's, it's you saying that I have bad taste and like, I don't have bad taste. And since that day happened, I have never said anything bad about my work since then. I've said that there are struggles with my work. I've said it's hard to do the work. When I put out a book and people like it, it is objectively good. And so I deal with a lot of data. I deal with data all the time. Like I'm known among a lot of people that like I obsessively look at data for Kickstarter campaigns and for creators and finances and all of this stuff like constantly. And so it's very hard for me to not say it's personally successful when the overwhelming evidence is like I will soon crest making over a million dollars in my business since I started. It's like mathematically I can't not say I am successful. So yes, I do consider myself as successful. I also love all of my books and all of the work that I put out. Like I reread them and enjoy them. Yes, I would say yes. I don't know if I'd consider myself as financially successful as Russell yet. I haven't been around as long as he has in this industry, but I feel successful also in the way that I get to do stuff that I love every day. I get to edit books, I get to art direct, I get to ink, I get to work with really cool people who like the same stuff that I do. And even though it's really hard work, it's super rewarding to just get to basically live the dream. I know it's ridiculous to say that, to live the dream every day and do that. And it's awesome. Can I ask you a question, Laurie, since we're here? You had like, it feels like you had like a huge like blowout year last year where like you leveled up like a hundred times. I'm curious because I remember when I first started doing Kickstarters, I was like, wow, someone made $20,000. Like they must be the most successful. That's the most money I could ever imagine. They must be like a super creator. And then I remember when my brain broke the first time I crested like $25,000. And I was like, I can't not say I'm successful anymore because I literally was looking up to these people for so long and now I've done that thing and my brain has to now consider myself successful. I'm wondering if you had a similar experience, ever experienced that disconnect moment. Yeah, I, I guess I would say yeah. Yeah, last year when we ran um, The Sundering, that was our first uh, tabletop book and uh, it, it crested $50,000 and you were messaging me, you were like, Lori, <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome like you're beating all of my campaigns and, but you were really happy about it and I was just like yeah you, wow you're right like I didn't even like it was so surreal that I was like oh crap like <laughs> <laughs> we finally, yeah, we did it. And I had, you know, other creators who have, you know, traditionally done really well messaging me being like, yeah, you're in, you're in the club now. <laughs> and <was>, oh, crap. <laughs> so definitely, yeah. <laughs> See, it's the victories that we, we don't realize we've accomplished. And once we think about it, it is what it is. We're successful and we've accomplished something in our lives. So we just have to look forward to that next goal.
Yeah, and it's funny too because during that whole campaign, I was like, "Oh, it's not good enough." You know, we're not doing. What else can I do to make this better? Like, a completely like in my own head, like this isn't doing as well as it should. And like my co-creators were like, "You're crazy! Like, you're this is record setting. What is wrong with you?" And I'm like, "Wait a second, no, you're right. Like, I don't." <laughs> There's when you launch a Kickstarter or any campaign, like you're in this mindset that it's at least me, and I'm trying to fix this, that it's never good enough and I'm never doing enough and I have to do more and I'm not working hard enough on it. So <laughs> having, you know, folks like Russell being like, You're you're doing awesome. This is amazing. Oh, okay. Okay, I need to stop and like breathe for a second. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I make sure to mitigate failure as much as possible because I know that it will happen. Publishing is a war of attrition. So 99% of the time, you're just trying to break even on a book and live to, to, to live the next month. And then once that book is out, you were like, okay, I've successfully made it to be able to put out the next book. I've talked to publishers of all sizes from small to large for almost all of them that I've ever met. They are fighting a war of attrition. They're trying to put out 10 books to find one hit and then that can pay for the other nine. I always knowing that failure is possible and probable, I've always played to get on base instead of hitting home runs, mostly because I had series that were in the middle of process, like Cthulhu was in the process and Ichabod was in the process and The God's First Chronicles and Obsidian Spindle. And I had all of these books. They're very long. Cthulhu is three volumes. That's like 600 pages. Ichabod is almost 400 pages. God's Verse Chronicles is 12 books or 11 books in a prequel novella. And then Obsidian Spindle is 12 books. So like, I was like literally just trying to live every day to pay my artists and my editors and everyone to get from one day to the next. I made a big transition because all of those series are now done and I can be like, oh, I don't have to pay people anymore for them because they have finished and the covers are done and like, I am set. Um, so uh, my way was to literally just mitigate it in as best a way that I can and understand that it happens and try to make sure that any one failure does not break the entire system. And so redundancies and things like that and, and like living way below the means so that I could pay my artists and stuff and make sure that we were moving forward when the inevitable happened. Also being two years ahead of my slate helps. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, to, to kind of link back to what I mentioned before, I'm still kind of working on myself and dealing with failure. I'm very hard on myself. Even just last year, a success was a failure <laughs> in my brain. But work in progress, easier on yourself. <laughs> um, and, and Russell's right, of course. Like, you just... You, you keep working on what you're working on and you keep making it and you, you adjust or you tweak or you pivot as you go. You know, failure isn't even necessarily something that you did, even though my brain wants to tell me that it is. You know, it can easily be, it can be anything. It can be the economy. It can be the time of year. It can be something similar came out and people, like it could be a million things and trying to not take that failure personally is a big thing that I am working on <laughs> for myself. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in some way, shape, or form, whether it's as a writer, an editor, or a creative endeavor that maybe you've inspired. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Be kind. I don't know how Lori came up or like what it was like, but people in comics and publishing were not kind to me when I started. Like they were not encouraging. They were, they were kind of pricks, frankly. Not everyone, but like the vast majority of people I've talked to said, you were a writer in comics, just give up. There's no room for a writer only in comics. That just hardened me to do it. And later on, the same people were like, like, we're trying to give you tough love because like, if you could be turned away, then you should be turned away. And I was like, is that true though? Does someone have to know that comics are like hard? I disagree with the premise and every year I disagree with it more. The two things that I think that you can do for a longer, for a younger generation is be kind, be kind to them 
be kind to the other people and be kind to yourself and then lead the way by showing the way by doing the thing. So often people that are in comment sections and are talking on panels haven't actually accomplished anything. However, because they happen to be in the comments with somebody else who is doing it, they feel like their advice is as valid. What I am saying is you've got 30 comments to this and 29 of them are bad. And the one I am giving you is the only one from a working professional in this industry right now. And so like be the one who is willing to go to the mattresses to make sure these people do not get taken advantage of, because that is the true tragedy in all of this. Like the true tragedy is that so many people with a bright spark get tossed out like yesterday's bathwater because they are no longer valuable or they spoke up or they X, Y, and Z. That is so unfair to everyone involved. And like my specific generation of like 40, round 40, like we are the people that used to gatekeep comics and publishing. Like we are that generation. And like, we do not have to continue to do that. We do not have to gatekeep this. We can just open it to all of the people that are creative. We can be supportive of everyone. It doesn't mean like spend 99% of your day like helping every single person because you also have to be kind to yourself. We do not have to continue the toxic relationship that our forebears had with this publishing industry and towards the people who were younger. We don't have to like have a casting couch. Like we don't have to do any of that stuff. Like we can just be better by doing better. That's yeah, that's just great though. I guess to kind of springboard off that, so as a woman in comics, um, especially as an inker when I started, like Russell said, it was pretty rough. Honestly, in publishing too, I know I have a lot of white cis men kind of eyeing me, like, what did she do to do so well? You know, you get a lot of, it's because she's pretty, that's why she's doing so well, and that's why her books are selling well. I've legitimately had people say this. So for new people especially like I, I guess I would focus on women because for me I've experienced and it's crappy and I don't want women coming into the industry to have it because women are awesome at making comics they deserve the platform to do so like a lot of the people that I've worked with have been women and they've been so cool and so easy to work with on Cthulhu is Hard to Spell one of our cover artists is Emily Manival and she was an intern in college and she made that cover and it looks professional and it looks amazing and no one gatekeeped her like Russell said I'm kind of springboarding off of what he said but so creating a community and inviting people into it and making them feel welcome and you know not crapping on them because they use procreate instead of paper and pencils and not gatekeeping the method of what they're doing or the genre of what they're doing or who they are or what they look like making stuff together there's there shouldn't be a competition here there should be a let's encourage more people to make stuff so that we have comic and we have this medium in a couple of generations and it doesn't die off because everyone's gatekeeping like i totally agree with you for me i would add like also siloing is a thing that happens a lot it's like oh you're a woman in comics like you can make these kind of books cute slice of life books you can't make batman like that's not a thing you can do and in the same way like, men are often making batman and we're like wait you want to make my little pony like you can't make my little pony like that's not it is much is much more done to women than to men like men have a way bigger latitude than this but i wanted to add the like we also don't have to silo people into this thing and say oh you must be Raina Telgemeier. Like, no, I want to be Kelly Sue DeConnick. So allowing people to not just make comics, but make the comics they want and not pigeonhole them into making a specific kind of comic because of their lived experience. I don't know. Sorry for taking that over, Lori, but... No, that's a hundred percent no, because I've I've also recently in the last year I've started inking over uh, Matt Frank and he does Godzilla and Transformers and like God forbid a woman is inking <laughs> kaiju and robots, you know. <laughs> it's, no, I relate to that very strongly. <laughs> oh no, two talented people. Jeez, you know, come together to create something amazing. Who knew? Exactly. <laughs> How dare I? <laughs>
<laughs> well, the, and it's funny because, well, you mentioned Madeline Holly Rosing earlier, and she's been on the show a couple of times. In fact, she's coming back next week to talk about her her upcoming series. And then Raina Teichelmeyer actually was on the show way back when when she was doing Smile a uh, long time ago. That's like a decade ago. <laughs> But uh, it's just amazing how career trajectories evolve from when you first initially start in an industry, no matter if it's writing or comics or whatever the case may be, filmmakers for that matter, like you mentioned, Darren Rodriguez, et cetera, to see their passion initially, no matter what industry they're in, to go to the heights that they currently are and then beyond. It's just amazing that the struggles and trials that they've had to go through where they're from or what they've done makes them better people overall. Yeah, 100%. If your life was a comic book or a, whatever medium you'd like your, your life to be in, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? <sighs> I need a minute for this. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, it, this is a really hard one. I think the soundtrack would be dark pop like Halsey or... Um, K flag because that's what I generally listen to when I create. I don't know what the name of the book is. Probably like, did you know? You know you don't have to say every word that pops into your brain. Something along those lines, maybe. I used to have like what my autobiographical comic would be called. I can't think of it right now. That's what's coming up right now for me. Oh, man. Uh, okay, so soundtrack would be Blind Guardian. So like mm -hmm. epic metal mm -hmm. for sure. That's an easy one. I don't... I'm not sure on the title. <laughs> I don't know. Russell, help me. I'm trying You're... to think. <laughs> I was trying to help you out. I can't, like, my brain is not working for either of us to come up with a title. I'm usually pretty good at, like, titling stuff. Yeah, how about an unlikely hero? That's in the vein I was going, so perfect, yes. Let's, we can do that. <laughs> we can, we could use that. Well, I do hate to say it, uh, Russell and Lori, but thank you both so much for coming on the show because that ends this particular episode. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a blast. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where's the, the campaign uh, currently and any other social media and websites you'd like to promote? So to back the campaign, it's easy. It's just uhstudios.com slash Back it. And that brings you right to the Backer Kit campaign. We're also really easy to find on Backer Kit because there's only a few campaigns running right now. Our website is just uhstudios.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's all UH Studios. UH Studios official on Instagram. Yeah, that's pretty much it. We're really easy to find, theoretically at least. <laughs> I'm at russellnolte.com, or I just started a Substack at authorecosystem.com. If you are an author and you want to sort of figure out how to build a sustainable career, that's what I'm doing over there. And then I'm available on uh, Facebook and Twitter, or I have my own social media that I started through Circle, which you can find at wannabe.press. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, you know, the number two. Of course, I am only one person, so my YouTube is a lot more updated than my website because I can only focus on one thing at a time. And that is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And the podcast is back after 13 or so years. You can find it at twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And of course, on every other audio streaming service available, just search for Two Geeks Talking. It's the only one available there. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.